The following is a paid program by Zola Levitt Ministries. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Zola Levin presents. Shalom and welcome to our program. I'm Miles Weiss. And I'm Catherine Weiss. We are grateful to be here in Jerusalem bringing you some upcoming shows for the coming year. You know, we are grateful to bring you these messages from the land of Israel. Yeah, we took our tour and we took you with us on this last year and we went from the north to the south, from Dan to Beersheba, and you will just rejoice to hear what our, our pilgrims had to say. Yeah, we can't, oh, we know that you can't come with us. Many of you cannot come, and so we thought it would be a great idea to bring the tour to you so that you could see what's upcoming for the millennium because we know that Yeshua is returning to a Jewish Jerusalem where he is going to rule and reign for a thousand years. We want to thank you for your Absolutely. gifts of funds. Without your gifts of funds, we cannot do this work. You know, so many times in the liberal media, Israel's maligned, and I know that it's you, our viewers, that know God's view and God's plan for Israel and it's our job to be watchmen on the wall and to stand. So thank you for any gift, small or large. It really goes a long way for us to continue to bring you these Israel Now messages. So come with us now as we show you some clips from an upcoming series, The Journey of Restoration, and we take you through the land of Israel with us. I love Israel, I love the people. Totally so, uh, it's indescribable. It feels like home. It just feels like home. Welcome to Jerusalem. It was, just took my breath away. Yeah. It just shows the, the fingerprint of God everywhere. To realize how special the city and the people were to the Lord. It's God's chosen land and Jesus walked on it. I think there's a restoration as Pastor Miles talked about. How God is really gathering the Jews in. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we've been grafted in, and, and uh, now this is, this is our city also. So all the armies who came against the nation of, of Israel Back in the, in, in, uh, all through, uh, through history, they always came right through here, through the valley, because it's a mountain pass. So as we speak about the final war, the final battle, the only way you can bring in to the land mighty army, it will be through the valley, okay? To follow from the northeast, the, the Jordan Valley first, and then the Jezreel Valley, on your way to the coastal plain. And indeed, for centuries, the valley you are facing was a battle zone and great, great wars, battles took place right here. And again, one more yet to come, the final war, the final battle. As you look across the valley, you'll see a big city up there on the mountains. And ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at Nazareth, the town of Nazareth, the big city up on top of the hills, okay? When, when Christ was born, when Yeshua was, was born in this country, he was born in Bethlehem, but he was brought up in Nazareth the town up there, which was much smaller. Today it's a very large city, but back then we were talking about a small village with maybe 20 families. Okay, but Yeshua had been brought up up there on the other side on the mountains. And you can find it very symbolic, very powerful thought. You know, this side of the valley in a way represents evil. We have talked about the, uh, the worship of Baal on the high places, Mount Carmel, or in, here at Megiddo. But as you look just the opposite direction, you're looking at the place where our Savior had been brought up. And one day they are going to meet good and evil right here in the middle of the valley. God has brought you to Israel to just not go on a tour, see the sights, get some exposure but to really get the heart of God for what he's doing in this land right now. And it's not something that you can just teach 
I mean, you can teach it, but to see it, to feel it, to smell it, to hold it, to connect with us as the body. I believe the Lord has chosen Miles and Catherine to really make that bridge happen in a very deep way because your lives were so impacted by the understanding that God's given. And so the fact that they have gone out in a sense to be ambassadors, it's not just about Israel. It is about understanding who Israel is in God's heart and in God's plan. But it's understanding that there is a body right now. We had 500 volunteers from 40 nations come and build this. And this was the first freestanding Messianic congregation built probably in 2,000 years. And so for that, the significance of it is that God chose the very, very top of Mount Carmel. When I got off the airport, you know, at the airport, and they said, welcome home, I'm going, oh my gosh, I never looked at it like that. But I'm home. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who press on for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when they would revile you and then persecute you and would say all manner of evil against you falsely because of me. You must continually rejoice and be extremely joyful because your reward is great in the heavens. For in this way they persecuted the prophets, the ones who went before you. Amen. Amen. And so we're off to plant a forest. It starts with a sapling, a spade, and some elbow grease. And it's so rewarding to know we're investing in the future of the promised land. Then back on the bus as our journey continues. We're now heading to Tel Dan, the most northern city of the kingdom, the kingdom of uh, Israel. We're approaching the foothills of Mount Hermon. It's lush green with flowing streams and little waterfalls. We walked along the winding scenic path leading to Tel Dan, where you can see the heavy walls that date back to the time of Jeroboam, who was the king of the Northern Israel Kingdom in the 10th century BC. Uh, this is known as Q4. Q stands for Qumran, four, cave number four. And remember that so far, scrolls were discovered in 11 caves. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered here, in this cave alone, in Q4. Okay, so uh, out of the 900 scrolls, 530 of them were found here. But not, again, scrolls not in very good condition in Q4, they've discovered tiny fragments, 14,000 fragments. As they kept looking uh, later on, they've discovered a thousand more. So we're talking about 15,000 fragments of scrolls that if we'll put them together, we will get 530 out of the 900. You know, the first man uh, to understand what it was, was Professor Sukanik. Uh, because he knew the history well, and the, uh, immediately as he was looking at the, uh, the scrolls and saw the Hebrew alphabet, so he immediately made the right connection, he began to shiver. He began to shiver. He was the first man to realize what, he, what it was, what he was holding. And um, that's an amazing story, because the, the exact date the, uh, that this man, Professor Sukenik, was looking at it, it was a historical day for the Jewish people. You should listen carefully. This was the November 29th, 1947. I'll repeat it again. November 29th, 1947. On the same day, the very day, the United Nations took the decision to establish the State of Israel, known as the Partition Plan. Remember, I've told you about that. 1947, 
the, the UN took the decision two years after the war, after the Jewish Holocaust, the UN took the decision to establish the State of Israel. Okay? So it was not a coincidence, no doubt, it was God's timing. God's timing. Israel is definitely a contrast, you know, we, we had Tiberias and, and green plush lands and Qumran, it just turns instant desert. Uh, and, and, yet, and yet, right outside of Qumran, they have huge date tree uh, palms that they're growing. And so, you know, it, it speaks of just the, the, the power of God to hide, you know, his word in the word there. And then the, the story they gave where uh, on the same day that Israel is declared uh, by the UN and, uh, and, and those are discovered, um, it just shows the, the fingerprint of God everywhere. Hello, I'm Wayne Fournier, and I've been a supporter of Zola Levitt Ministries for many years. You know, this ministry brings you the weekly television program Zola Levitt presents, the website, levitt.com, and the Levitt Letter, a free monthly news magazine. How has this happened without the support of a church, a denomination, or some endowment paying the bills? The Lord has seen fit to use regular people like you and me. We're the ones who keep this ministry going. You know, asking for contributions can be awkward, but not asking can be detrimental. On several occasions, our founder, Zola Levitt, would surprise viewers when he would say, we don't need your gifts of funds right now. Give to your home church or to another ministry. When we need support, we'll tell you, but we're fine right now. Such a statement sounded ludicrous, but it established the fact that Zola Levitt Ministries is not trying to make a fortune out of ministry. The resources and biblical materials we offer are those that are helpful to our viewers' spiritual walk. Zola went home to the Lord seven years ago, but Miles and Catherine Weiss continue to sound the call for the church to recognize that God is not finished with the Jewish people and Israel remains his timepiece. When I heard the gospel from a messianic perspective, it strengthened my faith in God, but it was something I recognized as being worthy of my financial support. If you see this outreach as worthy of your financial support, please call us at 1-800-WONDERS. Visit us online at levitt.com or write to us at Zola, Box 12, 268, Dallas, Texas. 75225. We depend on your financial sustenance. Thank you. You know, in 1948, the time clock of the ages started ticking again when the Jewish people came back to this land and it was officially renamed Israel. It's an ancient story. It's an ancient story, but Israel is a modern city today, and it's not only speaking of yesterday's prophecy, but it's speaking of today's prophecy. And it's our joy to bring you the stories of the Bible and of the witnesses that are witnessing of God's faithfulness today. But we can't do it without your gifts of funds, so please remember us at this time. You know, we love to bring you the stories from the Bible. We use Israeli actors. They're speaking in Hebrew with English uh, subtitles. But, you know, we also like to tie it into the present day to see how the blessing promised to Abraham is still in effect. So now let's go and look again at some clips from the upcoming shows. You're sitting in the synagogue. When the zealots came here, they refused to live in the comfort spots of the Romans. They lived in the walls. Now, I don't advocate asceticism. And I don't advocate Epicureanism. We're not going to indulge overly or torture ourselves. But it is notable that they were, it was important to them to not partake of the Roman system in any way. You're also sitting in the synagogue where, when the Qumran scrolls were found, Ezekiel 37 was found in this building. Ezekiel 37, if you remember, is the passage where God prophesies that the graves are going to open, the bones are going to come together, and that there will be a renaissance or a re rebuilding of the nation of Israel. In fact, it was a clear 
prophetic picture of what happened in Nazi Germany and the rebirth that followed shortly thereafter. Well, that was found right here. God confirms his word with signs. He confirms his word and does what he says he's going to do. And that's really our story, isn't it? God says it, and then he does it. Our job is to believe it, right? And that's what happens. And, and in this say, setting, it's really a place for us to consider what we are being called to as the church of God in this era, in this time. You know, are we being called to live for entertainment? Are we being called to live as Romans within a church setting? Or can we learn something from the zealots and learn something from the prophets throughout the centuries and really add in to our hearts the picture that we get from Ruth? Ruth the Gentile, Ruth the Moabitess, Ruth the one that was grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel and becomes the ancestor of King David and thereby the ancestor of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, David's greater son. And so we represent Ruth. Remember her cry? She came from the desert. The desert midbar means to speak. Whenever we're in this quiet place, when these zealots were here, when we are traveling through here, it's a time for us to hear what God is saying. Let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And that's what the season that we're in right now. What did Ruth say to Naomi, her Jewish mother-in-law? She said, don't let me go from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. And I submit to you that the awakening that's taking place in the church of God today around the world is that same message. That the message that is going to the Israelites around the world, the Hebrews in the diaspora and those that are living here is that the heart cry that's coming from you as Ruth, the Gentile, to Naomi's is let's go into the harvest field and meet Boaz together. Uh, the Hebrew name for Gethsemane, yes. it is Gat Shemen. Yes. And it means olive press, simply as that. I noticed that there's, in Matthew 26, there's the story of Yeshua in the garden with his disciples, but just with the olive, there's three pressings. Yeshua demonstrates three pressings also. Tell us. Exactly right. Um, the, the olives, when they were collected, they were brought to the millstone and they were crashed. And then the, the crashed olives were collected in bags and the bags were brought to the olive press. And uh, they used to uh, press the olives three times. Yes. And the first time they used, uh, but it's the press the olives, the finest oil, the yes. finest oil came out during yes. the first time that the olives were pressed. Yes. And that was known as the purest oil, the yes. virgin oil. Yes. That was used for anointing. For anointing the kings and for use in the temple. Correct. Sacred oil. Sacred oil. Okay, well, that's one. And then after a while, the bags were pressed again. Yes. And uh, so the, in order to increase the pressure on the bags, they used to add another weight. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the second oil was used for uh, healing and for light. Second pressing for healing and for light. And then another weight was added for the final press yes. to increase again the pressure. And all that was left was used for making soap for cleansing. You tie this into the Jewishness of the gospel. The blessing that goes back to the time of Aaron was when God told Moses to have Aaron stand before the people and bless them in this way. And every time this is done from generation to generation, I will put my name upon the people. So you receive this as from the Lord and let's take it from this place, okay? Yah Adonai Panavalecha Vihoneka Isaha Adonai Panavalecha Vihi Semlecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom. Be Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.
body and the blood. There was only one body, sinless, in the history of the world. It was the only body that could be broken so that we could be healed. The only body that could be broken so that we could come together. Only one body that is able to make us whole again. And that's the body of Yeshua. And the prayers that we pray go back to the time of the first century. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, brings forth bread from the earth. God, we thank you for sending your Son. Yeshua, we thank you for your body broken for us. We thank you that you are the bread of heaven that came, went into the earth, came up out of the earth, and presented to the Father as a ransom worthy. And we thank you for that sacrifice. In Yeshua's name, amen. Let's take that. Actually, what I thought when I went in the tomb was the reverberation of what John wrote in Revelation about what Jesus said to him. I am he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And it just bounced off the walls in there to me, literally. It's, it's an amazing place. It's called HaKodesh, which means the holy. Only the priests were allowed to be inside. We see there's different rings of holiness, right? We have the courtyard, which only the priests and Levites were allowed to be inside. In here, after the second curtain, only the priests. And then after the third curtain, in the Hall of Holies, it's only the high priests, only once a year. The menorah on the south side was from pure gold. It was one piece of gold, and it had seven lamps. Here, every day, they had to put olive oil in the morning and in the evening, because this was always burning all the time. But the menorah was actually the only light they had in this area, okay? The curtain here was closed. This was the only light they had. And just in front of it, on the north side, we have the shorebird table, okay? With the 12 shorebirds, which one represents each tribe, but it's holy bread. Only the priests were allowed to eat from this bread. But someone else did eat from this. Who was that? David, exactly. King David ate from this. But he wasn't alone, was he? No. Oh, he had 400 men, men with him. Now, those men that were with him, they're not so good people. They're thieves, robbers, right? Murderers, rebels, bad people. Now, we all know that God, he's a holy God. And God is the righteous judge because it's written in the Bible. So we had Aaron, the high priest. Aaron had four sons. Two of his sons, Nadav and Avihu, offered strange fire. What happened? God killed them straight away. Why? Because it took something holy and did something different with them. Right, they did whatever they want. Here we are in Petra. It is the place of some great speculation. Prophetic words and speculation. We've heard some history regarding the formation of this place. And we're also looking at the future here as well. Isaiah chapter 62, verses 10 through 12, and Isaiah 63, form a picture of the coming of Messiah. There's something spoken of there about the hiding, about the hiding away that will happen at the time of transition. Remember we spoke about the time of John the Baptist, Yohanan, Hamid Pi'il, John the Immerser. That was a time of transition. While there was a corrupt priesthood in the temple, at the same time, John was out at the Jordan River baptizing people unto repentance and including baptizing Yeshua. So it was a transitional period where the priesthood was failing, uh, a clean priesthood was arising embodied by John the Baptist, and at the same time, a transitional period leading to the crucifixion of the Lord. Well, so it is with regarding Petra. There is a lot of speculation about what the future may hold here, whether this will be, in fact, a place for Jewish folks to come and hide 
when the Antichrist is arising, at the same time that the 144,000 will be preaching and bringing in the greatest harvest at the end of the age, another transitional period, including what's spoken of as the time of the, the one whose garment is dipped in blood coming from Basra, Messiah. I mean, we have 15 different countries coming here to be in the land, uh, just to come and, and, and to harvest the grapes la uh, in the last year. And uh, so over the last year and a half, there's been over 500 people. There's been over 1,000 uh, people come since we started mm -hmm. coming here just to work in the land and, and to taste the, the grapes and the, and the, the wine that, uh, you know, even uh, uh, Yeshua said that, uh, that I'll not drink this cup again from my father's vineyard again until we, till we drink it again in the kingdom, in my father's kingdom. So that's not gonna be California wine. <laughs> you know what, and Isaiah 25 speaks about this feast, that this end times feast. And uh, there, what's happening, we're preparing for a huge feast. Uh, the, the, the beautiful thing is, is that the Jewish people are looking for it too. When we see what Tommy Waller is doing up in Samaria, standing with the Orthodox Jews and together Jews and Christians planting the vineyards, harvesting the grapes, making the wine, just as the prophets have foretold, we know that the Messiah is coming soon. Absolutely. We are in the time of the fulfillment of scriptures. Ezekiel 36 and Isaiah 49, they're all coming alive before our eyes and it's our joy to bring you these programs and we want to thank you for your gifts of funds that allow us to bring you these programs you know it takes quite a bit of money to, to fly us over here and for us to get the opportunity to meet with people that are working here in the land but it's our privilege to do it like i said before we set our face like a flint to fulfill the call of god that's on our life and on your life and that is to stand with the people of this land yeah it's so great for us to be able to work together with you with your gifts of funds and with our labor together, we are able to push back against the lies of the media, push back against the lies against the Jewish people, against Israel, and to make a statement together that this is a God thing, that God reestablished this state in 1948, and he is continuing to do wonderful things here. So we want to say thank you for standing with us. We always want to remind you, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.